Welcome to lecture four in the six lecture series on the foundations of deep reinforcement learning. A quick refresher, where we at? We already covered what are MDPs and some exact solution methods. That was lecture one. We looked at deep Q-learning, which is one approach that can deal with larger scale problems. Then we start looking at policy gradients and advantage estimation in lecture three. And we actually ended up with a quite complete and, and good policy gradient algorithm at the end. Um, but now in lecture four, we're going to see some ways to make that even better. So quick recap of our setting. We have an agent interacting with an environment by taking actions in the environment, getting to observe the environment, and based on that, take those actions. And the goal for the agent is to optimize expected reward accumulated over time. In policy optimization specifically, the agent will be represented by a policy, often under the hood, a neural network. And so we're trying to change the parameters of the neural network, the parameters of the policy, the parameter vector theta, such that we hopefully find the choice of those parameters that results in collecting high reward in the environment. So more formally, we're solving an optimization problem. We're trying to max over all choices of theta, the expected sum of rewards when using a policy encoded by that parameter vector theta. And it's a stochastic policy class in that the policy will output a distribution over actions for each state. And we've talked about this before, but it's a way to smooth out the optimization problem. And it actually even allows us to solve uh, problems where the reward itself is non-differentiable. We can still get gradients. Uh, on this objective. Here's the vanilla policy gradient algorithm, the baseline system that we'll start from in this lecture. So we'll initialize our policy um, by choosing some parameter vector theta. Our baseline is very often also a neural network. We also initialize that and it'll often represent the value function. Then we iterate. In each iteration, we run our current policy to collect a set of trajectories. Then at each time step in each trajectory, we compute the return from that time onwards. We compute an advantage estimate, which is the difference between the return from that time onwards and our baseline, which typically would be our value function estimate. How much do we expect from this state? How much do we get? The advantage shows us whether we did better or worse than expected, and how much so. Then. We're going to refit the neural network that represents the baseline by fitting it to the rewards to go. This could be done directly using this uh, Monte Carlo estimate of the return, or you could also use some bootstrapping, as we saw in the previous lecture. And then we can update the policy using the policy gradient by taking a step in the direction of the grad law of probability action given state times the advantage. So an action that resulted in higher than average reward, meaning a positive advantage, will increase its probability through this, and an action that was below average will decrease its probability through this. And then we go back, collect more trajectories, and keep repeating until we reach, hopefully, a, a good optimum. So in this lecture, we're going to look at some improvements we can make to that. At the end of last lecture, we actually saw some improvements on you know, variance of estimating the advantage, which remains very important. We're going to look at some additional complementary improvements here. One is we'll look at something called a surrogate loss, and then we'll look at step sizing, because a gradient tells you which direction to go, but how far. And actually, we'll look at some higher order optimization methods using trust regions that can have better step directions even and lead to more stable optimization through trust region policy optimization. But higher order also tends to be often difficult to run and neural networks, which have very large numbers of parameters. And so then we'll look at an improvement upon that in the sense that it is able to do a first order approximation to the TRPO ideas. And that last method, PPO, is these days maybe the most popular RL method out there. Okay, <clears throat> let's rederive the policy gradient equation starting from something called importance sampling. So we have our objective, utility here, function of theta is the expected rewards when using a policy, pi theta. That expectation, what's happening is a multiply and divide 
by p tau given theta old. The divide is happening here, and the multiply is happening by taking expectation with respect to theta old. So multiply divide, it will cancel, and we really have an expectation with respect to theta. Why do we do this multiply and divide by p tau under theta old? Well, now when we compute our gradient, <clears throat> what we see here is that we have gradient respect to theta, we have an expectation respect to theta old, we have this ratio here, and the beauty is that we can collect data from our old policy, then see in which direction we should improve theta. No matter what theta we're at, this equation holds true. So if our current theta is equal to theta old, then this reduces to a standard policy gradient, where we're able to now take a step in the policy gradient direction. But this all applies for any theta, no matter how close or far it is from theta old. Now, of course, when it's close to theta old, the policy we use to collect the data, this kind of estimate will be much more efficient from a small amount of data, we can get a precise estimate. If our theta that we use here is very far away from the theta old where we collected the data, it'll be a very high variance kind of thing. But anyway, through this derivation, we see that we can get the original policy gradient estimate where we use data collected at theta old to take a step from theta old in the gradient direction. But we can also see this is so much more general. Through this derivation, we see the same idea can be applied to any theta. And in fact, we can keep looking at this loss up here. And we say really what we're doing when we're doing policy gradients is we're taking steps, a step on this loss. It's like we're doing a first order approximation down here, that gradient provides us a first order approximation to this alternative loss function here that maybe we could be optimizing by doing more than just a first order approximation. And that's what we're gonna be doing here. The thing at the top here, we're gonna call our surrogate loss and we're gonna be able to do more with it than just taking a gradient. So we're gonna keep that loss around, keep that in mind, but we're gonna do more also with our step sizing. So, Step sizing is necessary as gradient is only first order approximation and gives you a direction that locally is good, but that doesn't mean you should step infinitely far in that direction. Locally, it's good. So how far should you go? So let's start with supervised learning. In supervised learning, if you have a bad step size, oh, okay, just the next update will correct for it. The data is waiting for you to give you a correction. But in reinforcement learning, if you have a bad step size, you have a terrible policy. This terrible policy will give you terrible data. And the terrible data might not have any signal at all in it, and now you don't get a correction. And what now? I guess you can just reset or something. But essentially, all your learning might be lost, erased, because your new data is just not informative anymore. So that's a problem. And it's not so clear how to recover from that unless you just shrink the step size. Um, but then you spend all this time collecting data on a bad policy, then you shrink the step size and try again. So is there any way to right away maybe have a good step size to so continue to collect good data and be able to keep improving our policy? So simple step sizing would be you do a line search in the direction of the gradient. It's simple, conceptually at least, but it's also a bit expensive because you have to evaluate. You have to say, okay, if I take a step size this large, let's do a few rollouts, let's see how well it does. A bigger step size, how well does it do? A smaller step size, how well does it do? And then finally you pick one and you do another policy grant update. It's also a bit naive because it doesn't really include any additional information about your approximation you're making with your first order approximation. And as I mentioned, we now have this kind of idea of a surrogate laws, other ideas that will bring into play that can help us. So here is what we can do instead of taking gradient steps. And this is trust region policy optimization. We're going to use our surrogate loss. Remember, which had the expectation respect to the old policy. So we collect the data under our old policy from the previous iteration. Then instead of just, just computing a gradient from it, we set up a objective, a loss function with the ratio of the new policy over the old policy. So by changing the new policy, this loss here will change. We can run an optimization on this without collecting any new data. The, the data has been collected under the old policy, and we're just changing this new policy in this objective here. And then, of course, we have here the advantage, which we estimated based on data collected from the old policy. Now, of course, because this is estimated based on the old policy, we need to be careful as we optimize this. 
we don't want to run too far away from the old policy because then this term here, the old policy advantage will probably not be very precise anymore. But we can definitely do more than just a first order update on this. We can do multiple gradient steps on this to do better than just a single policy gradient. Then in addition, what we can do is we can say, hey, as we do the steps, we know this objective, this surrogate loss is only very good whenever we're somewhat close to the old policy. So we should measure our distance from the old policy, the one that collected the data, and make sure we stay close. So now we have a constraint optimization problem. We say, let's optimize the surrogate loss while staying within a reasonable distance from the data collection policy, pi old. And then once we've done that, we have a new policy, we collect new data and repeat. So that's the full algorithm. Run our policy, collect data. We estimate the advantage function based on this data. Well, in this case, we can don't compute an exact policy. Actually, we set up this circuit lost, and then our deep learning framework will take care of computing the gradients on this. In some implementation, you'll use conjugate gradient to deal with this thing here, because this could give you higher order things, but let's uh, not worry about that for now. Let's think about the high level. We solve now a constraint optimization problem. And within this KL region, we find a new policy, collect new data, and repeat. And then, of course, a specific instantiation of this would be to do a first order approximation of the surrogate loss and do conjugate gradient based on the second order approximation of the constraint. And that would be a specific instantiation of TRPO that actually is quite popular, but there are others too that are simpler by directly optimizing the surrogate loss and directly using the KL. So to evaluate the KL, remember that when we're looking at the distance between distribution over trajectories, we have this product of action given state and next state given state and action. So when we look at a KL between two distributions over trajectories between two policies, we can expand this and we actually get a cancellation again of the dynamics here. Simplification, we still have the dynamics up front here, but that's just an expectation. That means we just sample from the current policy. And so we average based on samples from the current policy, the log probability ratio between the old policy and the new policy. And so once you do all this, here is some results. This is something I actually showed earlier in the overview of DeepRL progress in the last several years. These results that I showed them were obtained with TRPO, which is the algorithm we just talked about. And it can solve a wide range of simulated robotics tasks. Um, hopper, walker, swimmer. And here are some learning curves. Let's look at the, there's two versions of TRPO here. There's a vine version and single pass. There were two versions that blue and the green, and they do pretty well. Some others are competitive though, but then for a harder problem like swimmer, the blue and green have only one competitor that's close to them. Go to even harder problems, hopper and walker. The blue and green are clearly better than the prior works. And that's the two versions of TRP. And also worked on Atari games, which is kind of interesting. It's a very general approach. You can use policy gradient methods, uh, even though they're often investigated in the context of simulated robotics settings. You can use them on games just as well. And then combined with generalized advantage estimation, which we covered in the previous lecture, you can get this kind of result here. Uh, robot in 3D, learning to run through its own trial and error learning. Under the hood, it's running TRPO and generalized advantage estimation. And that you know, was the first way to get this to work now about five years ago at this point. But at the time was the, the first robust method to achieve these kinds of results. And then of course, um, you know, in this case, after 2000 iterations converse, it's running very, very fast, but then you can actually run it on other environments. For example, you could say, hey, how about running it on a maybe a four-legged robot? And then first the neural network needs to be retrained but over time, it figures out how to control this four-legged robot. In this case, you'll see actually it learns to run really, really fast, um, faster than might be realistic. But that, I mean, it's just taking advantage of the simulator and trying to maximize reward in the simulator. So a lesson learned from this run might then be, oh, maybe the simulator needs to be adjusted a little bit um, if you want to then also apply this policy in the real world. And then um, you can also do it to learn to get up. So humanoid here starts on the ground and through its own trial and error using TRPO and GAE learns to get up. All right. Now, the thing with TRPO, it captures 
I would say a lot of the intuitions that we want, it has a surrogate law, so you can do multiple updates on the loss. You don't just have a first order approximation based on your latest data. It has this KL that allows you to stay close to the policy that collected the data, which makes sure that your objective stays sufficiently accurate. But what it also has is the fact that to then deal with this KL, you kind of end up with this, well, the way it was done in the TRPO paper, a second order optimization that you need to deal with. And, and so the question that was asked at the time by John Schulman, first author on the TRPO paper and also first author on the next paper, I'm going to describe PPO, and which is currently, I would say, the most popular RL algorithm, was, is it possible to invent the version of TRPO that doesn't have this second order aspect to it? where everything is first order, which makes it easier to use existing deep learning frameworks, scales likely better to larger neural networks. Okay, so other things that actually were on channel's mind at the time were things like networks that have stochasticity like dropout. It was kind of difficult to deal with in TRPO setup and same for parameter sharing in TRPO. How do you do parameter sharing between policy and value function? It's not so clear with that trust region. So, and not to mention that the conjugate gradient implementation is complex and it doesn't harness the existing optimizers that we have in, you know, PyTorch, TensorFlow, and so forth. So, TRPO on the left. We have a surrogate loss, we have a KL. On the right, we say, hey, what if we move the constraint into the objective with a weighting factor? I mean, in constraint optimization, that's done very often. And it's actually known that for the right choice of beta, of course, the right choice is, is very hard to know what that would be, but at least ahead of time, but there is a choice of beta that will make both of these problems equivalent and that they will have the same solution. Okay, so that's interesting. So, and now we don't have a constraint problem, we have a, just an optimization problem. Once we have just an optimization problem, we can run gradient descent or SGD or RMS prop or Atom on this optimization problem do a few steps, and then our policy will click more data and repeat. And so that makes everything a lot simpler. So run a policy, estimate the advantages, do SGD on the above objective, or maybe RMS proper, Atom or something. You can then measure the KL. And if your KL is kind of close to your delta, if your KL is close to delta, well, then you're good. But if your KL tends to be quite a bit larger than delta, you want to crank up your beta to pay more attention to the KL. And if your KL is much smaller than delta, then you can decrease your beta a little bit. So in the next optimization round, it doesn't pay as much attention to the KL as it did before. So it might sound very heuristic, but there's actually a, a formal dual descent procedure that says that this is the right thing to do. So this is a very natural way of turning TRPO into a unconstrained optimization problem where we can use standard off-the-shelf optimization methods now with a little dual descent uh, update in the mix too. This captures a lot of the intuition that uh, you might naturally want to capture. It turns out this is just PPO v1. It's not the one that's most popular. This has been simplified a little bit. So how is this simplified? Look at that ratio in the objective, right? Um, so let's go back for a moment. We have the ratio and the objective, and we'll give that a name because we'll work with that in a bit more detail. And there's this other term here that is really trying to ensure that this ratio is, is valid, that you don't start using this ratio here in your optimization when you know the advantage that's multiplied with it is just invalid and, and you don't want to be there. So can we simplify this further by just looking at that ratio and thinking through it carefully? So that ratio, if the policy is the old policy, the ratio is one. And as you start deviating from the old policy, it'll go above one or below one, depending on which direction you, you start deviating for that action and state. And so the V2 of proximal policy optimization says, hey, let's directly do the kind of trust region aspects in some sense in the objective. And so it says, we're gonna do some clipping. Originally, there was just ratio times advantage. But here it says the ratio should stay between one minus epsilon and one plus epsilon. Then I have another thing, which is I also look at the original one. 
And what I'm comparing is there's a clipped version that keeps the ratio within certain bounds and there's the original. And I'm gonna be pessimistic about it. I'm gonna only trust the most pessimistic one of the two. And so it's very interesting because what's happening here, this is the original. And I'm gonna say, well, I'm not always gonna follow that because I'm not gonna trust it when this other thing is more pessimistic. And what this is doing, it's saying that if my ratio goes out of bounds, out of the one minus epsilon or one plus epsilon, well, once you go out of bounds, changing theta will have no effect anymore, right? And so I can change my theta to reach a certain one plus epsilon or one minus epsilon, but beyond that, it starts stops having effect and I can't influence the optimization with that specific state action pair. And so that's really what this is doing. It's saying that as you're, let's go back to the original objective, as you look at this objective here, each of these terms, what are they trying to do? For every term where the advantage is positive, it's going to try to push the probability up. Every term where the advantage is negative is going to try to push this down. And what it's saying is that for any single term, if you push this ratio beyond 1 plus epsilon, your objective cannot be optimized anymore for that term. So you can only have that much influence based on one term in your objective. Similarly, when the advantage is negative, once you push your policy such that this ratio has become one minus epsilon, this term can have no more influence. And so you're bounding the influence of every individual term. In the process, you're also saying the policy moving it further than one minus epsilon or one plus epsilon can have no effect. There's nothing to be gained from that. And so it's a different way of defining a trust region, which is directly doing it by looking at the objective and the advantages and bounding how far you can go for every single term here. And the math of it is also simpler. If you look at this, it's just like you know, some clipping and a min. And so you end up with effectively a simpler implementation than still having that KL to deal with. And once you do this, this has become one of the most popular approaches today for RL. So let's go back for a moment. This is gonna be this clipped loss is where you optimize the sum of those terms. And here's uh, some examples of uh, things done with it. two humanoids learning to play soccer was trained with PPO, they both are trained with PPO, try to beat each other, so it's a, it's a game they're playing against each other. Then OpenAI's Dota bots were trained with PPO, and it's a sign for how scalable this approach is. Very easy to scale up, because this was trained on a massive amount of game experience. The Rubik's Cube manipulation that we saw in a highlight in the first lecture was also trained this way. So let's see if this one to play. Uh, I'll scroll through it. So this robot hand is executing a policy that was trained 100% in simulation uh, on a ton and ton of simulation, uh, which interestingly transferred over to the real world thanks to setting the simulation up in an interesting domain randomization way. But for the purpose of what we're covering here, what's interesting is that this was done with PPO. So proximal policy optimization was used to train the policy in simulation that then was deployed on the real robot. And so I guess this is not the Rubik's Cube, this is the in-hand manipulation. In the first lecture, we saw the Rubik's Cube. Oh, and here's the Rubik's Cube itself. It was also achieved with PPO training in simulation, and then it figures out how to solve the Rubik's Cube. So um, let's see, what did we cover? We looked at this notion of surrogate loss where we looked at effectively importance sampling as a way to reinterpret what policy gradients really mean. Based on rollouts under the current policy, we can evaluate other policies based on this importance sampling surrogate loss. This allows us to get more than just a local gradient. We now have an objective. This objective can then be used within a certain region where we can trust it, which means close to where the policy that was used for data collection is, we can define a trust region with a KL, as done in TRPO, or we can actually do it by having a clipping in the objective. So the surrogate loss gets clipped. So any single term, whenever the policy would run too far away from where the data was collected, that term cannot contribute anymore to further optimize the objective. And that's what's done in PPO and gives an objective that's convenient to optimize with first order methods including existing implementations of SGD and RMS prop and Atom in existing deep learning frameworks. And so this is actually today, probably the most popular uh, RL algorithm, especially when data collection is very 
efficient because this really optimizes in many ways for wall clock time uh, in cases of efficient data collection. Whereas if you want maximal sample efficiency, then often you want to do a bit more off policy processing of the data. We saw some of that in deep queue learning in lecture two, and we'll see some more off policy methods in the next lecture.